The next guest we have here is Maria Teresa Kumar. She's the founding president and CEO of Voto Latino, the country's largest Latinx voting rights organization. And under her leadership, Voto Latino has registered over a quarter million voters. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us for the program today. Thanks so much for having me. I have to say that it's nice to see the Hill participating with Telemundo and Latina leaders. And I have to agree that the, what the mayor was saying, we double down. Uh, Voto Latino, we've actually registered over 1.2 million voters, uh, 650,000 of them in the last year alone, and mobilized 3.7 million in uh, key swing states. So we're excited to have the conversation with you today. Yeah, so, so you know, kicking it off, you know, how does your background of um, you know immigrating to the U.S., becoming a citizen as a child, how does that shape your passion around voting and getting people to the polls and making sure that other Latinas are also registered to vote? So I had the privilege of coming to this country, and I often like to say that I chose this country, uh, and it was in large part because I deeply believe that when we work hard and we are collectively thriving towards a more just union, then every single person wins. Uh, my family fled uh, Colombia when it was unstable, and it was a drastic difference of what my uh, life would have been like. My mother was a single mother. She is a of Afro-Colombian descent. And by a lot of those trappings, I my, my future in Colombia, had I been raised there, was already defined. And in the United States, it was an open slate. And so one of the ways we ensure equity in this country is making sure that there's participation. Oftentimes people say, well, where is the Latino vote? And then I have to kindly gently remind them that there is a progressive movement because Latinos voted in record number in 1993 when Pete Wilson was trying to pass anti-immigrant legislation uh, through the ballot. And Latinos organized, mobilized, and California went, come, went from being a swing state to a solidly blue state. It was young Latinos who convinced their families to become citizens and to vote. It was young Asian Americans who did that. And at Voto Latino, we recognized the agency of young Latinos to and convince their families. And so for the last 18 years, Voto Latino first started working a lot in Colorado, and then we expanded to Nevada, and we went into Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, Arizona, North Carolina, Texas, Florida. Hopefully you're seeing a pattern. And we've been in these states now for at minimum seven years, but it's because there's a huge rise in the Latino community that happened to be young. Uh, to give you an example, in Texas, Latinos are 23% of the electoral base, 52% of the classrooms. And many of us are first generation. And so there's an eagerness and an appetite for participation among the community, especially when they're faced in states where Latinos are feeling that they are being marginalized or sadly, increasingly uh, targeted uh, for under racial discrimination. Right, and it's been you know twenty almost twenty years since you launched first launched Voto Latino. Uh, you know, and you're talking a little bit about the importance of the Latino vote. Could you kind of maybe go into that a little bit more and, and specifically also mention the mistakes that politicians typically make when they are trying to appeal to these voters? Well, I think that the, the what makes the Latino voter so unique is the fact that so many of us are first time voters. And so when you are going in and trying to figure out which is the political party that fits you, you kick around the tires and you want to see results. You care deeply about issues. And it's the party that resonates with those issues that you end up participating with. One of the biggest challenges, though, is that the volume, I mean, just the sheer volume of young Latinos coming of age, just between the last election and the midterm election, just in two years, we're going to have close to 3 million Latino youth turning 18 years old. In Texas alone, close to over a quarter million. And so what politicians don't realize is that they need to speak with Latinos across generations. You have to talk about the issues that they care about. And you have to do it with respect. It's not enough to say that you're going to translate a handful of brochures and door knocking and leave it at that. No, you need to have a continuous conversation and relationship with the voter like you would with other communities. And so at Voto Latino, once we register you, we make sure that you turn out, but then we keep that conversation going. And I also, you know, I also caution a lot of politicians to go against tropes. You know, there's this idea that Latinos are very conservative when it comes to abortion, when they, they, you know, they're very conservative when it comes to guns. We just came out of the field in eight battleground states, the, one I, I, the ones I mentioned, Arizona, Nevada, Texas, Georgia, North Carolina, Florida, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, 
all of them, 68% of Latinos believe that choice is a private issue and that the government should not be involved. 81% believe in background checks. These are sensible measures. But what it demonstrates is that even among ruby red states, Latinos are close to 10 percentage points ahead of the rest of the population when it comes to these, uh, you know, these policy issues that we're combating right now. Now, if we start talking about climate change for young people, I don't have to convince them climate change is real. I have to convince them to vote because it's taken such a long time for politicians to actually have, take that into action. Right, and just a follow-up to this question, actually, Rafael has one for you, and so I'm going to let him take it away. So we, we know that Latinos have not been approached, and, and you're talking about the quality of that approach, uh, but it's also, speaking of tropes, it's also become a trope to say Latinos are not approached early and often. And I just want to ask you, who or what are setting up these barriers for that prevent, especially Democrats, uh, from from reaching out in a quality in a quality way early and often. I will share with you that the usually the rule of thumb by political candidates is that they're only going to reach out to people that have a habit of voting at least five times. They're called high propensity voters. By default, let those get left till the very last minute. What I mean by that is that sixty percent of Latinos are under the age of thirty three. If you're disproportionately young and you may not have voted because you don't have the capacity to vote five elections in a row, the parties both leave them out. In 2020, against uh, you know, according to uh, Naleo, who is an incredible prestigious organization, they did a poll and found that 43 percent, 43 percent, Rafael, of Latino registered voters did not receive a contact from either party. That's not practice. And so what the parties need to do is recognize that we're talking about the second largest group of Americans who swing elections. They are not just in California, but they are in, in the states that I mentioned that are deciding the map of our country. And so it's not a matter of using them as an afterthought. It's actively engaging them and being curious and meeting them where they are. And it's not enough to say that they believe in Taco Tuesday. It's much more important to say, show me the receipts. This is what we are actively doing for you. Let me follow up on that really quickly and, and pick on you a little bit since, since we have you here. Um, that, you know, that research, we've been talking about this research, that Naleo research, you're right, it's a very good research. We've been talking about this for you know, election cycle after election cycle. We, since I've that, been around, I mean, yeah, since, yes. To, yeah, I, I believe you taught me about this, to be fair. So, you know, we, we talk about this and this is communicated up to the party. So what is it that's preventing, whether it's donors, whether it's party structures, whether it's, you, you name it, super PACs mm -hmm. from following up on this research and they just jump back to the uh, likely voter model that clearly isn't, isn't doing the trick entirely? Well, it, by following the, that older model of if folks have registered five times, you're actually leaving out disproportionately the millennial generation and Generation Z. Generation Z and the millennial gen generation, Rafael, are larger than the baby boomer generation combined. Larger. And we're talking to a tune of close to 18 million people that are young, that are trying to figure out and navigate the country, whether you are Latino, Black or white or Asian or Native American. And as a result, it tells us that the political system has to reimagine and be much more sophisticated in how do you embrace this new growing group of Americans. Because as I mentioned before, I don't have to convince a young person that climate change is real, but I do need to speak to their language and I need to make sure that I can do some changes. And I think, you know, I'll, I, and this is where this, I can get, this can get me a little bit in trouble, but I also think that they need to diversify the consulting class. It's not enough to have a junior Latino on your team when you are actually developing strategy. You need seasoned individuals who understand the community being part of those executive teams, those managers, whether you're talking about a campaign manager where you're talking about bringing in a consultant class to do so, because I will tell you, for us, Florida was not a surprise. We were flagging the issues with Florida and the disinformation to so many people back in March of 2019. I think you and I may have even talked about it. At Voto Latino, we were not surprised what was happening in Southern Texas in September of 2020. We were waving the flag, but 
it was more of business as usual. And so the challenges are really is like, who are the people around the table making those decisions? Who are advising donors of the world that we're living in and the challenges that we face? And I have to tell you right now, one of the things that Voto Latino is, you know, you know, addressing along with great groups like Move On and Planned Parenthood, there's this sense of donor malaise saying, well, you know, it's inevitable that the Democrats are going to lose an election. And what I remind folks is that you've had great groups on the ground that were mobilizing individuals in 2018 and 2020. And those individuals know how to win. Double down on them and double down on those communities that brought you into elected office. Well, Maria, we do have you know people in the audience tuning in, and we have one who has a question for you. Melanie Mendez Gonzalez has sent in a question, and we're going to let her ask right now. Hola, my name is Melanie Mendez Gonzalez, and I am the founder of the blog Que Means What. And my question for you is, what is your message to Latinas who want to get involved in their community but just don't know where to start? Gracias. First of all, it's wonderful to see you. I, I know that you've participated in many of our power summits as well as Rafael and that power summit, basically we train young people how to be, participate in our democracy. And when people say, well, what can I do? There's a lot of things that you can do, but the first thing I'd encourage you to is to visit votolatino.org and there you can become a poll worker. We teach you, we train you on how to contact individuals and remind them on how their polling stations are and it's all through text message. It's a really low lift. Uh, if you wanna get more involved, then we actually send you off to concerts to watch really great, you know, great musicians play while you're registering our Latino voters. But there's a lot of efforts and if you want to do election protection, I encourage you also to reach out to Naleo. They have hotlines that uh, is in partnership, I believe, with um, both Telemundo and Univision. And the whole idea is that if you have any problems at the polls, you contact them and it's the 1-800 number. But there are a lot of ways to get involved. And just as important if you're a voter, I encourage you to consider running for office. Oftentimes people say, well, I'm not ready. I don't know any man who's ever said that they're not ready. Throw your hat in the ring and you can make, make transformational change at the local level. Our school boards are disproportionately, they do not recognize the Latino community in the classroom. If you consider making a monumental change in your community, in your children, or in your, uh, in your nephews or nieces education, uh, go and run for school board. It does a couple things. It helps address a local educational issue that we know impacts Latinos every single day. It teaches you how to run for office and it also starts creating a bench so that you go from school board to city council, to state legislators, to Congress, to, I don't know, maybe the White House. But it's to think about that incrementally. And if you're a woman uh, thinking of running for office, I'm uh, an advisory on the advisory board of Poder PAC and they help run uh, women for office at, at all levels. Maria, thank you so much. That was Maria Teresa Kumar, founding president and CEO of Voto Latino. Thank you so much for joining us today. Be well, thank you. And thanks for this conversation. Well, that brings us to the end of our program. A big thank you to Telemundo for all its support and to all of you attendees. And we do have to apologize for, to our audience for the technical difficulties with Representative Maliotakis. We would, love, we would have loved to have her on, but we're sorry we couldn't make it work today. But we do look forward to having her back on a future program. Uh, for any of those of you who may have missed the conversations this afternoon, we will have video up from the event up on the website shortly. And a big thank you to my co-host, Lex Juarez. Estás en tu casa. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to be here. I loved, you know, being able to help you facilitate these conversations. Thank you for helping us lead these conversations. Um, I'm Rafael Bernal. Have a good one.